Hi everyone, welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break and Adrenal Memories uh, Exam Coaching. Um, so yeah, I'm Lahiru. And I'm Stan. And thanks very much for being with us today. Hey, so the first thing I just wanted to put out is a, a plug for, um, we're trying to start a mentoring program and um, we've got a lot of mentees sign up, but we really need some mentors to help with this. So this is really people in their basic training years who've already got onto the anesthetic training program who might be interested in mentoring people uh, you know, and just what they did to get on the program. So if there's anyone out listening, I'll put into the um, story notes a link to, uh, you know, to, to the form to sign up. Um, and it's just a great way of kind of giving back and and, and also just, you know, promoting, um, you yeah, know, good education and good practice and welfare uh, in the anesthesia space. So if anyone's interested in mentoring, being part of the ABCs of Anesthesia Mentoring Program, please reach out um, to, uh, yeah, to myself, abcsofanesthesia at gmail.com or in the link that I'll provide. Excellent. Such a good initiative, La. I think that it's a wonderful thing to have that um, ability to give back, especially, you know, we're such in privileged positions at the moment. And I think, you know, having that leadership and having that advocacy can really set, you know, other can really change people's lives for the better. So thank you yeah. so much for what you're doing. And, you know, if there's anyone out there who's interested in sort of giving back, as La said, yeah, get in contact with him. Uh, yes. And, we're looking at for at anyone and everywhere, isn't it? Like, like I think in this day and age, it doesn't yeah. need to be area specific. Absolutely. And um, yeah, and I think that the big thing is if you're in, the, if you're lucky enough to be in a tertiary hospital, there's always people around who've just gone through the program, gone through the same thing as you, but there's lots of people out there in kind of remoter areas who, you know, weren't lucky enough to get the, you know, the good rotations in the city hospitals or they've come in from internationally and yeah, they just don't have access to these things and, yeah, I think that's what we're trying to do to just create a bit more equality of access. Very nice. Oh, the other thing that we need to quickly mention is mm. the winner yes, of correctly. our last uh, book giveaway. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So yeah, we... we... Oh, right. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> it's, a, hey, uh, it's a listener from Singapore and her name's Hazel and we're going to be sending you out a book uh, shortly. So the question was, uh, I think, what was the value of the or rather what does 47 stand for at the end of the alveolar gas equation and that's saturated water vapor pressure and the most important thing is that's at body temperature excellent so yeah is it hazel hazel's getting a book the lachlan rathi's um primary exam book which is great excellent all right now we're going to get this episode started so um to first start off with, what are we talking about today? Yeah, so this is pretty much uh, one, of, one of the SAQ topics from back in 2018. So 2018, first sitting, question four, outline the hazards associated with the use of CO2 absorbance within the circle breathing system and how the risks can be minimized. And, and this was a pretty bad question. I think 39% of candidates passed this question. So yeah, definitely not the easiest question out there. And um, what were the examiner's comments? Yeah, so they kind of go on to say, you know, in order to pass this question, candidates need to discuss several of the risks associated with the use of CO2 absorbers and the ways in which these risks could be minimized. And as soon as I see that kind of two-part answering system, I just think, oh, well, you know, you have a risk, you have a description, and then you have a solution. It really fits in a table-style format in my mind. So that's the first thing I'm thinking there. Um, there are multiple risks due to the presence of CO2 absorbent in the circuit, regardless of the nature of the absorbent, and also some risks which are absorbent specific. So that's kind of important. No general and specific risks. And then to pass the candidates had to demonstrate an understanding of these differences and discuss general risks and at least one agent specific risks. It goes on to say that you know, commonly the agent discussed with soda lime, which does pose, does pose some specific risks, but better candidates were able to differentiate agent specific risks by comparing it to the kind of older agents like, such as barrel lime and then newer agents such as AMSORB. Uh, they also talk about the discussion of risk reduction needed to be internally consistent, demonstrating that the candidate understood the rationale for the risk reduction method. Um, and common errors, apart from errors of omission, which were the, com the commonest errors, were including irrelevant detail. So you know, if you wrote equations, um, the chemical equations, which I think it's really great when you know that and you really feel comp com compelled to write that, um, that didn't score marks because it's not really outlining the hazards or the solutions. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. And you didn't really have to go through any of the constituents of the different absorbents as well. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I, th- I think this area of um, you know, in uh, of research has actually really advanced over the last uh, decade or so. Certainly, it's changed quite a bit since we last set the exam. I think when we last set the exam, it was primarily barrel lime and soda lime, mm. and Amsorb just I think was coming out into the market, whereas now Amsorb is pretty much standard and barrel lime obsolete. And soda lime, I think you're seeing much less of it uh, present as well. So I think, as you mentioned, the three ones that you want to know about are barrel lime, soda lime, and Amsorb. And you can probably think one of the newer ones. I'm not sort of too familiar with that, but maybe you can sort of go through it today. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you can say. Now, how would you structure this answer? Yeah, so like anything, having the structures helps me to remember where to you know, attach the knowledge. Um, and, you know, if you go into Academy Nightmares, again, really great summary and a good structure. Um, so Stuart Watson goes through physical hazards, degradation products, and other, and then pretty much just writes in table form. So I think this this really, this is really worthwhile, really helps understanding. And so we can go through those different categories now, physical hazards, degradation products, and other. All right. So we're going to start off with physical hazards. What would you say with that? Yeah, so I thought, you know, what what are the physical aspects of this absorbent that can be a real problem? So essentially, there's heat, there's spillage that can then risk, you know, risk injury to lung, skin, and eyes, airways resistance, and therefore obstruction. So heat, spillage, airways resistance, and obstructions. And so heat is just one of the things. And 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 again, at a, a lot of these things we don't actually think about these days because we've got you know, such great anesthetic machines and AMSORB and these new absorbents, which are less of a problem. And a lot of our nursing staff and anesthesia technicians take care of a lot of this stuff. So again, it's great that we have to learn this now because you, know, you might be going to another hospital uh, or so- somewhere in the third world where you do have to worry about these things and you're the expert. Anyway, that said, so heat is generally worse with barrel lime and sevoflurane and, and, and desiccation. So if, the, you know, if you're barrel lime, which now is out of out of um, use really just discontinued. If if that gets desiccated, absence of water water, and you're using sevoflurane, it's they've reported that you can get some insanely high temperatures. You know, even above 150, 200 degrees Celsius. So this has shown cases where you've had burns or fires and explosions, and it's kind of this combination of high temperatures as well as having some flammable degradation products because you, you know you can get formaldehyde methylene methanol and formic acid production and then that's in an oxygen and nitrous or not nitrous oxide rich environment so really these are all the ingredients for combustion and they they could occur in very specific circumstances so that's the problem barrel lime sevoflurane desiccation increase heat in an environment where you can have explosions and then the solution really is you know avoid barrel lime but that's discontinued but also using a well sealed well insulated canister, so you're not getting that kind of heat um, or burns risk, um, and then change when the when the canister is depleted as well to avoid desiccation. And this will this is kind of a common theme, but you've got to turn off your anesthetic machine when it's not in use because even if you just turn turn it um, turn down the flows or turn off uh, the you know the kind of the monitor, you'll still get this low flow of 200 mils. Uh, per minute of oxygen of oxygen going through in some machines. So really, you've got to make sure your machines turned off when on use, especially over a weekend when you'll have this, this long time of not having any extra moisture from patient contact occurring in that circuit. And then you need to change uh, the canisters regularly or after excessive use, or if you're not sure whether the machine was turned off. So maybe you come in that morning and the machine's turned on, and you're not sure whether there was it was on over the whole weekend of having no cases you should probably change that canister. Yeah, interesting. So it sounds like the way you're going to structure this answer is when you talk about a specific hazard, Mm. under that hazard, for example, heat or spill, you would have what are the risk factors? And then, you know, the question also asks how would those risks be minimized? And you would add that um, answer on that specific um, hazard. Is that right? Exactly. Heat is the problem, therefore burns, fires, explosions, risk factors, barrel lime, sevoflurane, desiccation, maybe a commentary about the flammable state that could be in, mm. and then my solutions. Okay, I think that works out really well. Um, now, the second one is degradation products. I think this is a big one. Oh, actually, and... I'll, just, I'll just go through spillage as well. So, Oh, yeah, spillage, yes. 
uh, so again, you've got this chemical, which is, it can be very base, you know, can be very a strong base, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and any spillage. So these days, you know, we, we just take out that canister, we take the, get the technician on our nurse to replace it. But there's definitely some places where you can fill it manually. And this, you know, this can cause, um, you know, spillage. And you don't want this to be in contact with skin or eyes or any other surfaces, really. And really, what's the solution? We've got pre-packaged CO2 absorbers, easy to replace. You don't have any chance of contact. And it's a well-sealed canister as well. Um, does that I do storage? remember that, actually. It was it was in one of the uh, older machines. I think it was one of the old uh, Dragers where you had to take it out. Very similar to cat litter. I don't know yeah. what you've got. Cats, yeah, but it's very <laughs> yeah. similar to emptying out uh, cat litter. So if you have cats and you've got an anesthetic machi machine at home, don't get these two things mixed up. <laughs> very dangerous for your cat. Um, so that's spillage. Um, and li yeah, literally you get the canister, you get your technician to pour it in. And that's how that's how we used to do it. Yeah. Um, airways resistance is interesting. And, uh, you know, th there's this optimal size. And I, I find this really fascinating because, you know, people have really just worked on this formula, but they talk about a four to eight mesh is the optimal balance between airways resistance and increased surface area. So the smaller the granules, the more surface area you have, which is great because then all the, you know, CO2, the CO2 has more surface to be absorbed into this um, CO2 absorber, but smaller granules, you know, the smaller it gets, it, it, it essentially becomes virtually a solid and that's a problem for airflow. So there's this four to eight mesh number. Mesh number really is uh, so the number of openings per linear, so per linear inch, and just to kind of conceptualize that, if you have a square inch, four means there's four holes in it uh, that can be passed, and uh, eight means that eight of these granules can be passed. So four to eight mesh is roughly the optimal size. And what that equates to, and again, this probably don't need to go into it too much, but it's just really interesting. When you have that closed compact container, if you have the equal amount of volume of granules versus equal amount of space, that's your sweet spot. So, you know, if you think of all the volume that's taken up by the granules, that total volume of these little circular granules, the space in between those circular granules should equal the volume to in total. And that, you know, so that's kind of trying to get the right balance. So the airways resistance and surface area absorption is optimized by that. Um, you can get obstruction. So imagine you get some kind of uh, you know, you forget to take off the packaging and put it in there, or you have definitely, there's definitely a case where there's a plastic wrapper over the outlet of this CO2 absorber and the, you know, the person's clicked it in with the plastic clear wrapper film still there thinking that was just getting, you know, part of, part of the system. And that's caused a complete obstruction, obstruction to airflow. So there's gotta be a patent hole into that, into that canister. And so just to uh, clarify, with the mesh sizing, mm. the smaller it is, the higher the mesh. Is that right? Uh, yep. The smaller it is, the higher the mesh number. Yep. Yeah. Very similar to gauge. Mm. So the higher the gauge number, the smaller the size of the needle. Okay. So we're looking at four to eight mesh is the ideal size of uh, these particles. That's great. And that gives you the optimum balance between airways resistance as well as absorptive capacity as well. Yep. So let's go on to harmful degradation products. And just to give you, you know, again, the list before the detail, compound A is the most significant, but there are other, you know, compound B, D, E, and G as well. Um, carbon, carbon monoxide, um, other, which I haven't really gone into, but formaldehyde and methanol just very quickly. And then historical stuff. So, you know, if you, back in the day, trichloroethylene, uh, again, you don't probably need to mention this, but it was it, it was associated with neurological toxicity and cranial nerve neuropathies and encephalitis, and they determined that this you know this form formed a toxin that was um, base catalyzed. Sorry, it was formed by being a uh, having a reaction with prior formulations of soda lime. So historically, trichloroethylene not great did some really bad stuff with with um, nerve damage and neurotoxicity. But let's get on to the main thing. So compound A. So it's, it's, it's really a reaction with sevofluorine and absorbent, and it's worse with certain absorbents. It's worse with barrel lime and soda lime, and virtually doesn't really happen that much with amsorb or the litho lime or the lithium hydroxide mixtures. So in, in experimental studies, nephrotoxic in rats at you know, this really small rate of 150 to 200 parts per million, 
And really, the, a lot of this is theoretical. So you probably have to mention this because it's part of the anesthetic history and understanding of sevaprin and, and, and its reaction with uh, sodaline. But physical factors include uh, so having a low flow or closed circuit anesthetic techniques, which is often what we do, having higher concentrations of sevaflurane, the type of absorbent, which we mentioned, barolime versus uh, greater than sodaline, and then higher absorbent temperatures and fresh absorbent. So uh, the, the solution to this is, again, don't use barolime, which we don't use anymore, and also using the recommendations are to use fresh glass, fresh gas flows greater than two liters per minute. And also the recommendations uh, were to limit SIVO for two MAC hours if the fresh gas flow is one to two liters per minute. But you know, as it is to date, there's no data showing any relationship between sevoflurane use and post-operative renal dysfunction. And this includes patients with preoperative renal insufficiency. And so there's a, there's a comment in one of the things I read, which was maybe these recommendations have come out prior to these kind of the new extra knowledge about that, just the lack of any uh, renal complications with sevoflurane, even in long use, even at low flows. So I think the most important thing here is that we know that nowadays low flow sevoflurane and its association with compound A uh, in humans, it's of minimal clinical relevance. But in saying that you do need to know historically that um, it is nephrotoxic and it was, it's been nephrotoxic, nephrotoxic in rats and also what the risk factors are. Uh, it's one of those really tricky ones where you know it's not clinically relevant, but there's actually a lot of science behind you know, why it's potentially toxic in rats. Are we just wasting our memory with this? Is that <laughs> I know. Thing? It's nil clinical relevance. <laughs> I know, I know. Sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? I think that, you know, a lot of the primary exam uh, knowledge, <laughs> you sort of read about it and you go, well, where am I applying this in my in my day-to-day -day practice? And especially uh, now that if Barolime is discontinued, as Miller says, I mean... <laughs> yeah. Anyway... <laughs> But look, that. I think, you know, the, uh, I guess the argument in terms of why it's important to know is that the product information in sevoflurane in Australia hasn't changed. Yep. And it still recommends uh, that uh, you use fresh gas flow above two liters per minute or uh, limit your sevo to two Mac hours. Yeah. And uh, that still remains in Australia. So I think it's good to sort of know why it exists at the same time. I certainly know that UK doesn't have these restrictions anymore. Yeah, so, okay. Good to know. There you go. Yeah. Um, I think what, one of the confusing things about uh, Compound A, and you know, I, I think for everyone out there, it, there's a lot of conflicting information with uh, soda lime in terms of whether it needs to be desiccated or fresh or moist. Did you read anything about that, whether desiccated soda lime is worse or fresh <laughs> soda lime is worse? Yeah, I haven't written this down, but uh, I just recall it saying it can happen in either. It actually doesn't, mm. doesn't matter. I'm pretty sure that's from Miller's being the prescribed yeah. text. Yeah, look, I, I've seen uh, evidence for both. So I've seen evidence that says that fresh soda lime is worse than desiccated soda lime. And I've also seen that, uh, you know, um, the uh, uh, I think written somewhere with desiccated is worse than fresh. So look, if anyone out there has any definitive evidence on this please yeah send it to us yeah all right uh, now so after compound a what's the other big one that we need to be talking about yeah carbon monoxide and yeah you know just reading this this was quite alarming i'll tell you why so first of all it's a reaction of the absorbent with the chf2 which is the difluoromethyl moiety in the volatile so you get that reaction and a few factors increase the risk of production of CO and carboxyhemoglobinemia. So an inhaled anesthetic for given MAC multiple. Um, so, so essentially, it, 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 it does relate to which anesthetic you're going to use. So desflurane is worse than enflurane, worse than isoflurane, which is much worse than halothen and sevoflurane. So that's the, you know, the order of how risky this could be. Definitely the, the degree of desiccation of the absorbent is, is bad. So you don't want to have dry absorbent the type of absorbent, again, potassium hydroxide worse uh, than sodium hydroxide contain, containing uh, absorbers, higher temperatures, high concentration of anesthetic, low fresh gas flows, and this, uh, you know, actually a smaller patient size. So imagine the amount of CO per, you know, carbon monoxide per, um, you know, kilogram of patient 
is a factor in this. So mm -hmm. when you think about this, you think of a hot, dry, you know, machine or absorbent left over the weekend with low flows, that is not a good mix. And they've measured like hemo, uh, carboxyhemoglobin con con uh, concentrations of up to 35%. And again, we all know that you know, once you get carb carbon monoxide binding to hemoglobin, it is it is just terrible. It not only limits the amount of oxygen delivery, but also can be toxic at the mitochondrial level. So being you know um, cytotoxic as well as um, hypoxemic, it causes hypoxemic hypoxia. So again, what are the solutions? To this avoiding barrel line, avoiding continuous use without a break. Uh, make sure that you you know the machine is completely turned off at the end of use and that you should check the canister uh, before use as well and replace if, you, if you're ever concerned that that low gas flow has happened over the weekend, just change the canister. Um, and use, using cyclofluorane is a potential solution versus using ISO and DES. Um, and then, you know, not using it with barrel lime and using... Oh, so you, there are measurements here where if you use barrel lime or soda lime with less than 2.6% or 4.6% of potassium hydroxide, uh, it, it, there's negligible risk of this or just use the newer agents such as Amsorb. Um, and they've got a mention of using uh, lithium hydroxide as well, which is very expensive. Mm. Again, one of those things that uh, doesn't happen in our new yeah. CO2 absorbents. And again, a, a very historical uh, idea in terms of uh, carbon monoxide production with soda yeah. lime and then more so with uh, barrel lime. It, and it, is, it is good though. I mean, you learn all of this detail because you know one day you may be out there practicing in a different circumstance, and the fact that you know all of this means that you're not just, I guess, a one-trick pony of anesthesia in the first world. Mm. Mm. So it sounds like um, you know just summarizing. There's really, I guess, two big things for the degradation products: mm. uh, compound A and carbon monoxide. I think those would sort of um, you know be the core of the answer for this uh, subtopic here. Mm -hmm. And would you have anything else after that? I mean, just mentioned that formaldehyde and methanol could could be used, but uh, they don't go to much detail at all um, in uh, Miller's at all. And yep. in the examiner's notes, they don't really tell you to mention much more than that. Yeah. And I think you also mentioned a very um, historical volatile anesthetic, I think earlier in the piece, and that's really going back almost to, I think, 60s or 70s and that's that trichloroethylene wasn't it yeah that's right trichloroethylene um yeah so anyway just yeah historical risk with neuro neurological toxicity but that, again that's not, the one that's um contraindicated in soda lime because it produces that uh, neurotoxin yeah yeah that'd be right okay great and um all right so what other things do we need to talk about or do we need to add into our answer it, we've got we've formed a really good answer already i think that uh mm. you've subcategorized it into physical hazards and degradation products where physical hazards can be subdivided into heat, uh, spillage, increase in airways resistance, and then degradation products. You've got uh, compound A and carbon monoxide. Excellent. Now, if you can sort of, yeah, answer that in about, I think, seven or so minutes, you've got another three minutes. And what would you add on to that? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, the other, uh, uh, the other, the other category could be unrecognized exhaustion of your product. And again, there's not the there's not the biggest deal because you'll always have your FI CO2 monitor, and, and you know the end tidal CO2 monitor in general anesthesia is a mandated monitor. So you know you really have to get by. You know you, your blood pressure cuff just needs to be available, ECG needs to be available, but you need to have your gas analyzer, end tidal CO2 and FI FI uh, monitor. And so the background to this is normally you'll see this color change. I think ethyl violet's the one we can't you know commonly see mm -hmm. where it changes from a, you know the, this the granules are white and they change to purple um, but you can get a reversal of color that's the first thing um, when you know unused hydroxide ions migrate to the surface so you can have that as a problem and then depending on the indicator you can have indicators in different uh, solutions that actually go different ways so you can have completely different colors being the indicator of uh, exhaustion and you can have some uh, absorbents that have no color change at all. So while it's, it's great to be able to see a color change happening over time and go, okay, I'm worried now about my CO2 absorber, you know, being exhausted. Really, I'm looking at the FI CO2 regardless. Like, you know, even if you have no color change and your FI CO2 is five and then 10, 
then you know you're obviously going to change this in many circumstances. So really, solution for this check before each case, make sure it's not ex exhausted. You don't want to be changing your CO2 absorber in between a case. Um, and then, you know, using capnography for every GA case, which is again mandated by our, our guidelines and, and having mm. invisible. Um, the, so the other risk, which I guess is related to this is you can have leaks in your assembly. Like there's always multiple components in an anesthetic circuit and soda lime canisters and the fact that, you know, they're kind of interesting to dis disconnect and reconnect. You can easily get leaks there. I mean, I remember one leak, which was particularly hard to find, was the end tidal CO2 cable, that little, you know, line was lodged, because it's so flimsy, was lodged into the CO2 canister when we had it hooked up. So it had just caused this tiny leak. And, you know, the canister seemed to be sitting properly, but it just happened that the CO2 sampling line was just in the way. <laughs> And so, you know, anyway, there's many ways that due to loose granules or multiple components, even dislodged or defective packs, you can get leaks. And that means that your anesthetic agent might not be delivered, delivered and all the inherent problems of awareness or, or, you know, just inability to ventilate someone with a leaking circuit. Um, now, one extra thing is, I, you know, I find low flow anesthesia quite interesting because, you know, it's probably absolutely right to do for minimization of volatile anesthetic, but... What, that, what happens is then in long cases, your CO2 absor absorbent gets exhausted much quicker, which means you have to change it. So you've got this problem where you've got rising Fi CO2, your absorbance down, and now I've got to change my canister. And that's generally not recommended. So it's a real kind of ca catch-22 when using low-flow anesthesia. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I think with that idea of low-flow anesthesia, um, it's that balance, isn't it, between volatile usage Hmm. And your CO2 absorption uh, canister also being uh, exhausted as well, and having to sort of change that uh, mid case. Yeah. And certainly when I run Tiva, I do higher flows. Do you do that also? Yeah, I do. And uh, maybe it's just because, you know, I started back in the day when you kind of had to, the recommendations were two liters per minute of fr uh, fresh gas flow with sevoflurane. I'm just always used to using two liters and you know, just everything, the whole operation works well with that. And so like, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. When, I, when I've started using low flow with SIVO, um, it's just really interesting because not only do you have to change your soda lime in really long cases, but this extra thing happens where you get moisture build up and a substantial amount of water collects or moisture collects in um, one, of your, you know, one of your limbs of your um, breathing circuit. And have you ever noticed this where that, moisture goes back and forth and triggers breath support from your ventilator and it's just this very typical scenario where you think oh the patient's breathing you give them more relaxant and it's actually just the movement of the extra moisture because you use low flow anesthesia um, and that's just another pattern I've, I've come to recognize uh, you're not giving more muscle relaxant it's literally just stopping the circuit and then disconnecting and and you know it, what is it I'm, I'm literally emptying about maybe 300 mils of moisture from the circuit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, um, no. Someone's just commented, yes, on many occasions we had to empty the moisture water. One of the bosses uses 0.3 liters. So yeah, if you ever suddenly go to 0.3 liters fresh gas flow or you know, something really low, long case, you will get this problem and it'll be a pattern you need to recognize. And that, you know, the first time I saw that was quite late in my career because I never used fresh, low fresh gas flows for super long cases. So yeah, mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. No, that's great. So in this last three minutes, if you had some time, mm. the other things that you could add just to summarize would be unrecognized exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And that's to due to the idea where you've got the indicator um, ethylal, ethyl violet, which turns purple as, the, um, as you increase CO2 absorption. So in other words, it turns purple as the, um, as the CO2 absorb becomes more acidic. But then with, with it being uh, exhausted, you can actually see that violet sort of change, change back to clear as well. And I think I've seen that before, where certainly you've had a clear CO2 absorber, but you can see that your inspired CO2 is climbing. And I think that's probably a better indicator of uh, CO2 exhaustion than uh, ethyl violet. Yep. And then the second one you talked about is awareness. And that's a really good one. I think that uh, you know, you always need to be aware that if you decide to change a CO2 absorber mid-case, 
mm. you can see you're inspired to to just drop because of that dilution because you are changing a CO two canister with filled with volatiles with a new fresh canister that's going to dilute the whole circuit. And I think a solution then that I normally do is that I normally increase the flows and also increase the concentration. Um, I, I do find that with end tidal control, it may be a little bit slow to pick that up. Do, mm. what, what do you normally do? Like, do you just leave it and just monitor it? Uh, or yeah, do you try it, to um, compensate? Or do you not even change the CO2 canister mid-case? I think there's some people who have that. Uh, very I definitely, I definitely do change the canister when I need to. Uh, but also, because it's been, the, the patient's at steady state, I just keep the flows going as normal and it just it just sorts itself out. I think it, you know it's obviously worse if it's unrecognized, but again, you don't you don't not recognize a leak because you'll get this massive, you know, alarm going and, and mm. you know, loss of pressure in the circuit. So I, I just can't see that being a real problem for me. I've, it's just never been an issue. Yeah. You know yeah. what worries me when um when you change the CO2 canister, you need to like click it into place with oh, a yeah. bit of force. You ever worry about it, yeah. you know breaking it as you do it, and then you go, "Oh damn, you've burnt your bridges because now you've got a anesthetic machine with a broken CO two canister <laughs> that is no longer a closed circuit; it's now an open circuit." Yeah, oh, and I, look, that does worry me because it, it, it's not the most seamless. Like when you put the sevo, it's say you put the sevo fluorine canister in, that's just a very seamless. There's just no problems with it. Mm. But you know, you see someone who's never put a CO two canister in. They will have trouble putting it, so it's it's not the easiest thing to replace. No, that's right. Mm-hmm. This is, and this specifically is for the GE machine where you need to like really yeah. force it up, and so it clicks in. Because uh, <laughs> you right. know, if you try to do it gently, it doesn't click into place, and it can actually hold itself. But you will notice that there will be a leak. Yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> hey, so one one extra thing. Um, just as I'm reading about this, you know, litho lime is this super absorbent. Like, was it point for every pound, you get point nine. Um, pounds of CO2 absorption versus like 0.5 with Amsorb mm. or something like that. Um, so it is the most efficient. It is extremely safe because it doesn't have those um, strong uh, strong um, base products like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, but it's got an extremely high cost. But because it's so efficient and it's so safe and in, sp- in spite of the cost, it, it's what's used in kind of in space travel, I think it, in, even, even in underwater travel, when you need to mm. absorb CO2 very efficiently, that's the kind of you know substance that you that's used outside of the uh, normal anesthesia context um, in kind of the, those different environments. So yeah, I thought that was just really interesting. Yeah, no, that is uh, very interesting. Hey, there's one thing um, that I would also add to mm. this list as well, and that's to do with the absorption of CO2. It um, comes to mind, and that's to do with malignant hypothermia. So um, with CO2 absorbers, they do absorb volatiles. Mm. in the presence of um, malignant hypothermia, you do want to remove it. So it, it is a potential source there. And that and that would be a certain risk. And you can, okay. I mean, the solutions would be, you know, during that crisis, you either remove your whole anesthetic machine with the CO2 canister, or you can use the charcoal filters. Yeah. And, and so specifically, the recommendations are a malignant at-risk patient, you remove and so you change the CO2 and replace mm. it with a fresh one. Absolutely. Because it, the old one has volatile in it, but then if you were to uh, have a, a, a new onset in case malignant hypothermia, they don't recommend te- you know taking the CO2 canister away. You just turn up your flows, leave it in there, and you know maybe maybe put your charcoal. F- Actually, do they recommend charcoal filters? I can't remember, but I think I think charcoal filters are pretty standard now. I I know that we've got them at our institution, and seems to be yeah a, a very standard. Uh, procedure and when you do have someone with MH. Yeah, it's easy enough to do. It's easy enough to do. Yeah, I agree. Um, now, is there anything else to add to this answer? Uh, it looks like a very complete answer. I think if you can get all that in, you know, that would be a definite four out of five, um, four to five out of five. You've yeah. got the idea of the physical hazards, degradation products and other, and certainly other is where you can actually push your answer from a three to a four to a five. But there's certainly the core ones I think you'll need for a pass in the uh, answer with the physical hazards, heat, spillage, airways resistance, and then the degradation pod- products would be discussion of compound A as well as carbon monoxide. And then then you talk about those other things, very historical things like trichloroethylene, um, exhaustion, uh, and potential for awareness and hyperthermia. So lots there in this answer here. 
And likewise, if we've forgotten anything or we've had any inaccuracies, just please email us, Lahir and Stan at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, get back to you with a correction or an answer, but I think that's uh, covered it pretty well. It's excellent. Now, I think one of the things is most trainees will try to memorize the formula for CO2 absorption. I mm-hmm. don't think in this answer here it was required. Is that right? That's right. You didn't need to use a formula at all in the answer. Okay. Uh, that said, would you learn the formula? I think it's I think it's reasonable enough to learn it. I think that's part of the is it part of the syllabus? Um, it's a very broad idea. Yeah. In terms of uh, understanding how absorbents work, I look. I think it would be asked or could be asked in a viva. Certainly, I think that uh, the way that I would think about it, I know. If you try to look at the formula itself, it can be confusing. But then the first step when you want to memorize the formula is just understand what happens with CO2. So, I mean, the most common thing is that CO2 combines with water Mm. to find carbonic acid. And then after that, you need a way to get rid of carbonic acid. And, 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 And I think you can really, yeah, like to simplify, you can memorize the net reaction pretty easily. Like, you know, what's the purpose? You want to get rid of CO2. So that's your first thing. How do you get rid of it? Every one of these things has a hydroxide. So this one, you know, mainly uses calcium hydroxide. So CO2 plus calcium hydroxide becomes calcium carbonate and water and heat. And that's not the that's not the craziest thing to memorize. You know, CO2 and calcium hydroxide is the thing that you want to combine it with. If you combine calcium and car, you know, carbon dioxide or CO you get calcium carbonate. And where does that extra hydroxide go? That becomes water and heat. Yeah. And that's the net reaction. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, if you need to talk about the catalyst, sodium hydroxide, that's the intermediary step. Mm. So before um, carbonic, acid, carbonic acid mixes with uh, calcium hydroxide, it mixes with either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydro- hydroxide mm-hmm. uh, historically to form either potassium carbonate or sodium carbonate. And then that's the one that mixes with calcium hydroxide. So you've got the net reaction and then you've got the intermediary reactions as well to think about for the catalyst. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's too hard, hopefully to learn that formula there. Um, I think you just got to look at it in terms of um, the process of getting rid of uh, CO2. Now, I guess the last interesting fact is, I don't know how accurate this is from when I learned it, but uh, in terms of CO2 absorb, absorption for uh, per 100 grams of absorbent, it's approximately 26 liters. I don't know whether you've got something different uh, in terms of that or whether anyone's got something different, but uh, you know, from my notes, I've got uh, 26 liters or from memory, 26 liters per 100 grams of CO2 absorbent. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Excellent. Should we get a questions or? I think what was really confusing, I think sometimes people can get... Uh, lost in the facts mm. of uh, the the desiccated versus moist mm. uh, CO2, especially for compound A. I think for carbon monoxide, it's, uh, you know, desiccated is bad. Yeah. But then from comp- for compound A, I, I, it, I think it was a little bit ambiguous. Beautiful. Someone just asked, can you please repeat the part about the mesh ratio? Hey, so yeah, the mesh number is really just referring to what's the optimal size of these granules. And so I wouldn't even worry about the definition of it, but just imagine a sieve and you've got, you know, only certain types of particles can fit in that sieve. So if the, if a square inch of this holds, you know, filtered or sieve structure, if you can fit four in a square inch, that's four mesh. So that's a certain size. If you can fit eight, then that's eight mesh um, per square inch. So that's where that, you know, four to eight mesh number comes in. What's the point of that? The point of it is, you know, they've got to decide what is the ideal granule size. If it's too, if it's very small, it's great for absorption, but terrible for airways resistance. If it's too large, imagine just one large granule has much less surface area, but really great for airways resistance. You know, there's just a whole uh, network of air, air around it, which you know, air, air can pass back and forth through. So that that four to eight mesh ratio is the ideal ideal granule size. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I think the other way uh, to do it, to explain it, uh, let me just see what I can show it here. I'm, I'm just going to show you what uh, last sort of means in terms of uh, an area. 
Oh. So they talk about four to eight mesh. So you think about this, this is just like a little square area. If you had something that's four mesh, they, they just talk about it in terms of like four strands across. So this, so this is something with four strands across and then you create these little holes. And so if your granules can fit through this, this is called four mesh. Now you want to create something with eight mesh. That, that means that that's got another uh, two more lines here and another two more lines here. Now, I haven't drawn it in proportion, but you get what I mean. So that now that the holes in general are smaller, and if you can fit that into the holes here, these smaller holes, that's considered eight mesh. So it's, it's the number of strands, as Lars says, per unit area, where the unit area is an inch. Great question. Hopefully that gives you some clarity on a, on a little bit of an esoteric topic, but I think it is a topic that uh, is quite commonly asked especially during your Viva journey. Um, I, mean, I think the probability of this coming up in the written is probably on the lower end. It was asked in 2018, certainly an earlier version, more generic version was asked uh, much earlier, which, which was just talking about CO2 absorbance. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, I think um, you know, Lars giving you a very, very good summary and a very good structure to bring to a written exam, as well as to be able to sort of discuss it uh, quite well for a viber as well so thank Excellent. you so much thanks everyone for watching and listening so yeah we'll put this out on a podcast and youtube as well thanks for listening please share with anyone who might be interested and we'll see you all next time for another and next don't forget to sign up to yeah last mentoring so just to plug it again yeah. if they want to um get hold of yourself to learn more about it they just need to email you yep. and what's the email Yes, yeah, so it's either abcs of anesthesia at gmail.com or actually got another email, Anno's Mentor. So A N O S Mentor at gmail.com. Um, I'll put the link in uh, the story notes below as well. And we're looking for anesthetic registrars who want to link themselves up with trainees or pre anesthetic. Yeah, the uh, ones who trainees. will be applying for training this year for next year's training program. Yep. yep. Fantastic. What a great initiative. All right. Thanks so right. much, La. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Man. See you, everyone. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well. 